Hello everybody, thank you so, so much for joining me. My name is Alex Steele. This is the Alex Steele Show. This is episode number six. And we're gonna go ahead and call it season two. We're gonna have a little season each month, and each season we're gonna have a theme that we're gonna work on. This month, we're gonna work on adornment. So, in the fire right now, I have a piece of inch and a quarter by quarter inch flat mild steel bar. So that's about 30 mil by six mil flat mild steel bar. And we're going to make a Brian Brazil style horse head belt buckle. And that is just kind of to celebrate and it's inspired by the release of Brian's new online course at my online school at beginblacksmithing.com. And so that's why we're doing the Brian Brazil horse head belt buckle. It's also a lot of fun. And this is the type of project that is it's, it's great to make as a gift for somebody, great to make to sell at craft fairs and things like that. So I'd certainly bear that in mind as you have a watch. Remember, of course, guys, please ask as many questions as you like. That's the idea of this. This is about us being able to interact on a much better level than we can otherwise during the week when we're all busy doing other things. So ask your questions and, of course, please, 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 I would love it if, while you're watching this, at the times that you enjoy it, go ahead and hit share. If you're a member of any Facebook blacksmithing groups, go ahead and share it in there. I would be seriously appreciative. Let's get the word of blacksmithing to as many people as possible, and let's have a lot of fun while we're doing it too. Glad to see that you're all on Facebook. Fantastic. Fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. Okay. Are people tuning in? Should we get started? Yeah. Oh, hey, YouTube. Okay, fantastic. Well, it looks like we got a good enough crowd started. We'll go ahead and start. Um, this first heat is, it, this is one of the kind of more, more critical heats of the horsehead bottle opener. If you've followed any of Brian Brazil's stuff on YouTube, you will have seen this. And it's, it's quite incredible doing this one heat horsehead. Um, I'm gonna try and also lay out my, uh, my tools for punching the hole. And I think I have very smartly Oh, that's, that's fantastic. I didn't, I didn't put out a slot punch for myself. That's all right. What I'm also gonna do is I'm going to go ahead and reforge another tool that I don't think is gonna be necessary. Ah. I think it'll actually be this one right here. I'm gonna reforge this, and very quickly, we're gonna try and, uh, try and slip it all in, that I'm able to have this ready to punch the hole for this. So I'm going to open up a little crack in the forge there. Enough for me to get the tip of that in. Don't want to heat it up too hot. And we're going to go ahead and start with the one heat horse head. I just want to double check you're all good on Facebook. No pertinent questions looming. Let's make sure you all come in, come in, come in, come in. Great. Great to see you, Daniel, Matt. Great to see you, Brian. Great to see you, Jeff. Great to see you. Joel, it is fantastic to see you. Vidar, it is fantastic to see you. It's great to see you all. Let's get cracking. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and hit it with the brush and, uh, and we'll go straight onto this horse head. Okay. So I'm gonna take a little less than a cube of material. My material's thinned quite. You know what, actually, so in the waiting time for that steel to get hot, I've had it in the, in the waiting time for us to start the live stream. I've had that steel in the fire, and of course, anytime your steel's in the fire, it's gonna oxidize. Now, the problem with it oxidizing is if you leave it in there too much, it oxidizes too much. Well, I'm very sorry to say, but the result is, is you do lose a lot of mass. So I'd actually ended up losing a little bit of thickness, which is gonna be very important later on. Rasp it. We'll go back in the forge for another heat. Okay. Ah. Pick up that piece of steel. Getting myself tangled up in these wires here. Okay, let's put that little smoldering out. See if I can untangle myself out of these wires. Put up my hammer. And 
forge this punch down so we can use it to punch our hole. Break it down. Then I'm going to come over and go to the vise. This is usually typically something that I'd use the belt grinder for. But um, ah, since we're doing this live, we'll do it the, do it the proper way. I'm going to flatten it off, and once it's flat and square, I'm then going to hit it at an angle. And I, I very much have, like having these kind of pointed slot punches. Obviously, you didn't want to have a pretty obtuse angle. I very much like it because it means that you can lay out your hole without fear of putting in a big old divot, like one might if you just had a you know regular old flat slot punch. So this is uh, this has its benefits. It's quite warm though right now, so I'm going to cool off the back end of it just to allow it to conduct the heat back. And for this particular situation, I'm not going to be worried about heat treating it. Uh, I'm going to be making sure that I use it. I, I use it on hot steel, not cold steel. So much for uh, proper preparation and planning. Making sure I had a slot punch would have been a smart thing to do. Hey Matt, great to see you. Jordan, awesome to see you. Okie dokie. So now we'll be able to go to the horse head. So we come over here, take a little less than a cube. And I'm going to go ahead and forge half on, half off. With the round die of the hammer. get that Brazil horse head forged. So naturally I want to kind of keep this relatively close to the parent material size in thickness as I go ahead and reduce this. And I'm trying not to draw too much back of the neck, um, you know, less so than I would usually. Putting a little flat spot on the nose there. Then we're going to come right back over here. Thanks, Sam. And swoop. You know, the Brian Brazil one heat horse head is quite the incredible piece of design and forge work. And it's very simple, very, very simple. You know, I've had guys excel at this even when they've only done a one-day class. Um, you know, Brian also has had students do very well at this with a very limited amount of prior forging experience. You know, and the key really is just being able to get good at your half hammer face blows. Swoop across here. That swooping gives it a little bit of extra dimensionality it otherwise, otherwise might not have. And of course, there's your, uh, there's your one heat horse head. So, I'm gonna turn down the forge a little bit. That thing's really cranking. It also might help your ears a little bit. How cool is our tool? Set that up there, it's a little bit warm. Not hot enough for that to do any damage. Fantastic. Brian Rosales from Texas has asked me whether any of my students have problems getting tools home. Um, not that I'm aware would be the question. Airlines and, uh, and TSA equivalents around the world don't seem to have a problem with tools so long as they're in the checked luggage. Uh, and so they've always been in checked luggage anyway. Uh, and nobody's had any problems. I've flown with tools all over uh, and I've not had any trouble with it really apart from kind of odd looks uh, and, and stuff like that. Let's see some more questions.
Zane, I'm thrilled that you're liking my videos on the theory and the deeper thoughts of blacksmithing. I really appreciate that. I know that, uh, that, that that video I posted, what was it, on Monday last week, got a little bit of controversy about the gas forges, but, uh, but I still think that's a valuable video. And I think if one actually watches the whole thing, a lot of people who had a problem with that, they actually didn't watch the whole thing. It's funny that. The people who watched the whole thing, you know, I, I think that uh, certain people could have got a lot of value from it, and I'd like to think so. Okay. A little bend in the neck, and you'll notice I haven't punched any of the neck details, any of the face and neck details currently. There is a reason for that, um, <laughs> and that is if I was to punch the facial features right now, like the eye and the nose and the ears and the fullering, what I would, what, what, what the risk that we have, which isn't like you know, risk implies there's a possibility that it doesn't happen, but what will happen is as it goes in and out of the forge, it's going to be oxidizing, it's gonna be getting hot, it's gonna be building up scale, and in those facial features, you want it to be nice and crisp, and so if you put your facial features in first, it's gonna get pitted, and get those kind of, that, that, that porosity in the surface, it's not like true porosity, but porosity in, 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 uh, in appearance on the surface that comes from it being oxidized and that takes away from the cleanless. Wow, Dustin, the Okmulgee's Blacksmith Guild auction raised over $3,000. Thank you so much for letting us know. That's amazing. Outstanding. Huh. So what have you guys all been up to in the workshop this week? I would love to know. Please go ahead and share that in the comments. That would be fantastic. What's going on YouTube? You guys might have noticed, I've got a big wad of electrical tape on my thumb, thumbs up. I, I, I ground the tip of it off slightly. Um, yesterday? Yesterday. I, I'd recommend against doing it. The real problem is I can't fit it in my glove anymore. So you're gonna see me fiddling with my glove. That's because the tip of my thumb is missing. I didn't take too much off, it's not that serious. Okay, let's go ahead and punch this hole. And as always, when I punch, I punch until I feel the anvil. Feel the anvil there. And I like to come back to the back side and hammer it back. This seems to mean that I have a better indication of where my hole is. Um, I can let it cool down a little bit though. Steel, you know, it likes shearing the plug when it's a little bit of colder temperature. When it's too hot, obviously, the steel is just so ductile that it'll just kind of stretch and stretch and stretch rather than shearing. Um, and I'm, I'm quite prone to wanting it to shear right now as opposed to stretch. So now I'm going to go back from the same side and re-establish my bullseye right there. That gives me a very good little bullseye. And then I can go ahead from the back. There we go. Line it up. And you know, if you were doing this for the first time, you'd want to make sure you're there, but I know I'm there. So I can just go straight in and, uh, and punch the plug. So it's just hanging on by a tiny, tiny little thread in there. What I'm going to go ahead and do is use a leatherman the way they're intended to be used. And you see, here's something that's very easy to get uh, in a pickle about. Most plugs that you ever look, have look like they're stuck, they're not stuck. They're just hanging in there, and it just takes the tiniest amount of touch to push them out. That was literally just touching it. However, had I been thinking to myself, oh crap, that plug is stuck, and then gone back in from the other side and tried to drive it back through, what would have happened is naturally that plug's like this. I would have made it expand out, and it would lock itself in the hole. You'd then be in the situation where, okay, the plug that was like almost totally free is now stuck in the hole. Um, and, and that, my friends, is called the pickle of a situation, something that you'd ideally want to avoid. Where's a drift? Let's see if I got any drifts out here. Sorry? I'm just looking for a drift. I should have... 
it's usually on this table. Oh well. It's either here or it's not. Oh, it's here. Huh. Great. I keep tangling myself up in this cable. Great. What's going on, Facebook? How are you all doing? Conan has asked me, how do I know when I have oxidized the steel too much? Well, a little bit of a little bit of a tricky answer to give. You know, certain times one might want to oxidize the steel if you're wanting that particular type of finish on your piece of metal. However, like, you know, when you're oxidizing the steel, naturally you're kind of you're kind of weakening it because you're making it thinner and you're just, you know, making it rather become steel, just become iron oxide, and that's a problem. Um, but you know, if you want it clean, just it, it's difficult for me to say. If you want it clean, don't oxidize it. If you want it to look kind of, you know, a little bit more grungy, then, you know, let it oxidize. Uh, you'll see when it's oxidized because the surface will be pitted and it will not be clean and crisp. Okay, you see those black rings? We're going to go ahead and call those the black rings of death. Black rings of death on the drift. You know, it kind of indicates that that steel is cold. I mean, it kind of indicates, it absolutely indicates that that steel is cold. And were I to keep forging, I'd kind of call that, I, I, I think that would constitute forcing a drift. And you never want to be forcing a drift. You know, forcing that steel to come apart. Firstly, you've got to wail away, put way more force in than you should. Secondly, you might risk putting enough stresses in the steel that it, it might indeed want to tear itself apart. And of course, interesting, not interesting, just useful, don't pick up your drifts with your hands because they're hot. You know, pick them up with a pair of tongs, cool them off. Keep those things cool. And back again we go, this time in the other side of the hole. And you see what's happened there is the uh, end on my drift is too large, improperly maintained, so it means that it does not release itself through the hole, and I've got to do that myself. Oh well. Great. Now I have my hole. It's now time to cut the steel off and begin forging the loop that is going to hold the belt buckle itself. How are you guys? Great to see you, John from Florida. Gene Smith, do I use mild steel for my drifts? For, for drifts that I use to open holes in hot mild steel, I just use mild steel. You know, I use whatever I got. Mild steel does the job just fine, and I tend to have mild steel in more sizes. Uh, you know, so I can have a quarter inch, quarter inch drift, a five sixteenths drift. I mean, all in metric since I'm in the UK. So I can have the different sizes in drift. You know, since I buy mild steel stock in all sorts of, uh, of sizes like that. However, in applications where we're using the drift as a support, as an anvil inside the hole, uh, you'd probably want to avoid using mild steel, as mild steel does not have the resistance to heat and resistance to pressure um, that you know a steel that's higher up in the spectrum of things with more alloying components to it might well have. And so for example, a hammer eye drift that is getting very hot and is taking a lot of pressure, you want to make sure that you use an alloy steel that's, that's, that's suitable to that application. Um, but just for opening holes, mild steel is going to be just fine. Um, they will be consumable, however. All drifts are consumable there, you know. There, there's a lot of kind of abrasion going on with those things. And uh, you're beating on them. Yeah, I mean, all drifts are consumable. Vincent, I'm thrilled that you got the sticker today. That is fantastic. I'm pleased that it's, uh, I'm pleased that it's gonna look good on the truck. And by the way, guys, if you see me commenting, that's Sam. Just put like a little dash Sam so they know it's you. Oh, you didn't? Oh, right. And it just did it as you were, okay, I see. Oh, you, you, you okay. Okay, 
So I'm now gonna go ahead and cut this off. It does have a little bit of scale in it. Quickly switch to the GoPro, this is gonna look awesome. Okay, you guys ready? Shower you in sparks. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and cut this off. I'm um, being kind of careful not to cut too close. I go ahead and hit the sides first. And then I roll up on the high sides and line it all up. And then that means I have a score all the way around. Try not to collapse the hole when you hit it, of course. It means you have to hit a little bit further on the material rather than off. And try not to cut it all the way off, especially when you've got a wooden building like right there. Make sure you drop the brush. That's like a critical part of forging. And then get tangled in a lead and try not to trip over. <laughs> and then take a pair of tongs and you know, in a more controlled fashion, of course, break it off, throw the other piece in the water. How have you guys been enjoying this week's videos on YouTube? I think they've been going good. I've, I've had some very, uh, I'm very pleased with some of the videos that I've been putting out this week, and I'd love to know what you guys think. Uh, Dustin Bolgren, the material and size that I recommend for making hammer eye tongs. This is something that I cover in one of my online courses, the evolution of tool making just to let you guys know. Um, but I'll also let you know that, okay, for hammer eye tongs, it, it depends. You can take half inch round and make your hammer eye tongs out of half inch round. You can take three quarter inch round and make them out of three quarter inch round. I've done them out of either. Um, and obviously, this, this is something that I've learned from Brian Brazil. He's done it out of either. The first time I studied with Brian Brazil, we made it out of half inch. The next time we made it out of three quarter inch. Um, commonly now, however, I'll use 5 8 inch round and you'll want to make sure you use an alloy steel. I don't have a pair of hammer eye tongs here, but you do subject, subject them to a lot of force. A lot of, a lot of springing is required in them. If you make them out of mild steel, they're more likely to bend. You know, my hammer eye tongs, I'll use them on the smallest, smallest, smallest top tool all the way up to a 15 pound sledge working under the power hammer. That's the kind of versatility that you get with a pair of hammer eye tongs that are adjusted in the correct manner, correct proportions, correct angles, and, um, and that's kind of critical so that you can forge the smallest tool up to the largest tool. Again, if you kind of want to know a little bit more about, uh, about how to do the hammer eye tongs, that is in that online course. No, John, you're absolutely correct. It's not a real project until you drop it under the floor. Um, Sam, in this particular instance, I'm going to be heading over here on the anvil, and I worry as to whether that's going to be in front of the camera. I mean, we could, we could equally just shuffle that. I think that might do it for them. I reckon that should do it. You guys just start shouting and screaming if this doesn't work. Okay. Then we'll forge this open. I don't know if you guys have any, ever seen the uh, tutorial on how to forge a bottle opener. That's in the intermediate, intermediate course. But uh, this is pretty similar. You know, I'll briefly go over it, you know, hit the high spots, focus on the highs. And then square it off. Things to bear in mind when you ever do these. I'm gonna go ahead and take my glove off. Just losing a decent bit of dexterity. Things to bear in mind when you do these is make sure you go all the way around. You don't wanna stop halfway. You don't wanna stop there. You wanna go all the way around. So of course, if you guys have just joined, this is the Brian Brazil Horsehead Belt Buckle. This is a really, really fun project, one that I really hope you do. And the reason that we're covering it is because we want to talk a little bit about what we have released this week. And, uh, and that is the Brian Brazil online course, his first online course at my online school, beginblacksmithing.com. Whoa, almost dropped a hammer out of my hand. <laughs> at beginblacksmithing.com. And... It's, it's a great one because the stuff that's shown in there hasn't really been shown. What's going on? No, I'm gonna go back. It's the stuff that we show in this online course, that Brian shows in this online course, are techniques that formerly he hasn't really put out there a whole lot. Um, he's very much known for his tool making, um, and, and that's fantastic. That's what people have been traveling all over the world to learn from him from. And, uh, and you know, that was my kind of introduction to Brian Brazil was through his tool making. However, you know, with 35 years of blacksmithing experience, 
making things for sale, um, he developed a lot of other techniques and, and refined a lot of other techniques that allow him to make some incredible things. Some of these things are his forge welded bundles. It's a wonderful technique for taking all sorts of different pieces, you know, forge welding them together in an efficient, you know, user friendly manner without having the clutter of pieces falling, falling all over the place, forge welding them together and then being able to play, create beautiful products as a result. Um, you know, the forge welded bundle, it's amazing. One of the other things that he's covering in this course is, of course, his scrolling and coloring, which is something that I think has been so rarely documented of his, because um, the scrolling and coloring work that he does is quite incredible. Um, and the levels, the, the distances to which you can take it is, I mean, it's fascinating. It's, 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 it's absolutely fascinating. And it's, no, it's, it's something that I have to say I was very honored and privileged to be able to watch. Um, I'm very privileged to also have been able to watch it while I was bloody editing the thing. You know, it's very educational, certainly. Absolutely. You guys better see that, that, that banner up there. Use that coupon code. on Facebook. Dustin, this month's theme is adornment. And I believe that was your suggestion last week, so thank you very, very much. If it wasn't your suggestion, it was somebody else. Whoever that was, I apologize, but I think it was Dustin. I think it was. He'll have to let us know. Is it true that heating the steel over and over again will make it lose some of its characteristics? Uh, well, I'm just a dumb blacksmith. I dropped out of high school um, and started beating stuff with a hammer. I haven't got a clue um, in terms of like the theory behind it. I've heard that it's the case. Um, I've experienced that it's the case. That's about as far as my science goes on that particular subject of, uh, of metallurgy. You would have to consult a book. <laughs> so usually I'm gonna, you know, on a bottle opener I might leave it diagonal. In this case I'm just gonna take it round. Or at least a rough round, you know, it doesn't have to be super perfectly round. Simulate a round. Wonderful. So now we'll flatten this out and we'll see if we've got enough length of the loop for the actual belt buckle itself. I should have worn my horse head belt buckle. Keith, great to see you. Keith and Nadine from Canada. Jason, any tips for working wrought iron? Not something I've done a whole lot of. Um, you know, I've, I've done a few pieces in wrought iron here and there. Keep it square, just like any kind of weld, uh, you know, because wrought iron, it's all welded material. Keep it square. As soon as you develop a rhombus, it's going to want to go ahead and tear itself apart a lot easier because of the fibrous nature of the material. Keep it square. Forge pretty hot, don't forge too cold. Again, you know, because of the fibrous nature of the material, the way it's going to put together, not quite as, as, as strong and resistant to the colder temperature forgings um, as mild steel might be. Uh, so keep it hot. Keep it square. If it comes apart, take a nice welding heat, nice, nice soppy heat, and just gonna tap it back together. You know, consolidate the mass and keep going. Okay. So I'll go ahead and hang this over the edge. Do a little brushing blow. With these little brushing blows here, the idea is. Flatten that bad boy up. Enough that we can stick it in a belt. However, something to bear in mind is due to the angle of the horse, we kind of want to angle this accordingly so that it's square. And that means pushing this top end in just a little more. 
It always looks a little bit funny to make this happen, but it's very important. You want to make sure that you're square with your, uh, with your pin to the uh, center line. Take another heat. So, guys, have you shared this stream? What, 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 what are they waiting for, Sam? Like, why wouldn't they have shared the stream? Why would you be watching this thing and not share it with your friends? Like, you don't see how upset the hammer is? It's falling on the floor, trying to hurt itself. Like, why would you do that? That's just, just share the stream. Like, just, just share it, man. If you haven't shared the stream and you're watching this, like, I don't know what to say. I'm just upset. I'm, I've got tears in my eyes. Let's, let's keep sharing this stuff. It's fun, you know, share this metal, metal squishing goodness. This angle here is important. We want to make sure that that is not. We want to make sure that the center line here and the square of that loop is going to line up with where our pin is going to be. Flatten that up. Make sure that we can stick a belt through it. Plenty of width. Great. So now, what I'm going to go ahead and do. I might do that now, do that later. Now I'm going to go ahead and. Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and punch the details now. We can do this later. Now what we're going to do is turn this around, work out which orientation we want, how do belts go on a belt buckle. That way. Great. So I want the face on this side. And we're going to begin punching the face details. So when I put this in the fire, I'm going to try and get my tools ready for uh, the next step. Thank you, Sam. I really appreciate that. Chris, thank you so much for sharing. Outstanding, guys. Seventy-six or eighty on YouTube. My goodness, YouTube! Thank you so much for the incredible turnout, guys. Really, really, really appreciate it. Okay. So, here's my nose punch. Where is something else? I don't quite have the ideal fuller. I'm missing it for a while. Ah. I think it might be cause for a chiseling or just another fuller. You know, I think I'll use a thicker fuller. I pontificate the choices. So many choices. Where did it go? It's right here. Here's a thicker fuller. And we'll probably see if we can transition that into a smaller fuller if we have it. Otherwise, oh well. I think that's going to have to be the thicker fuller. From there, we also need a chisel. Hopefully in somewhat sharp space. There's the chisel. We also need an eye punch. Here is the eye punch. Eye punch in order that we're going to use it. You know, we're probably going to go ahead and use the eye punch first. Then the nose, then the chisel, then the fuller. In anticipation of what we've got to do that heat. You're going to want to make sure you have a glove when you do this because Big flat surface, a lot of heat, a lot of heat, a lot of heat, a lot of heat. Henry Cobb, thank you so much for sharing from Mississippi. I really appreciate it. Okay, let's take our heat. See if I can remember which way this had to go. Okay. Go ahead and lay that on the anvil there. I'm trying to line up my eye. I don't usually do them from this side, but for belt buckles, it's kind of critical. Whoa, that's a hot piece of steel. I'm going to flip that around, save myself burning my wrist too much. Let it go. Come oh. on. I'll go with the nose. Uh, go 
a little deeper. Now, you'll notice the pace that I'm taking this is pretty slow. I also got a little double punch mark in the eye. That's all right. Nothing worth worrying about. Then I'm going to lay my chisel half on, half off. Again, this is the Brian Brazil horse head. And the reason I'm showing this is because if you go ahead and buy his online course at beginblacksmithing.com using coupon code LIVE20, if you want to go ahead and grab yourself 20% off, by the way, you can see how to make the three-dimensional version of this. Brian's three-dimensional horse head is kind of an incredible thing. I mean, it's astonishing. Doing this very similar process in 3D, it lends to incredible results. I'm always astonished when I see Brian do it. And you might well have seen some of my YouTube videos where I've done it in the YouTube videos. It's, it's I mean, what a, what a product. Alongside that in the course, you also get to learn how to do the scrolling and coloring that Brian has done so incredibly, but sadly has had little opportunity to share as much as his tool making, but the scrolling and coloring that he does is quite incredible. Oh look, we got a moth on the set. We've got a moth on the set. I did try and kill it. Don't kill the moth. What's the lead time on pre-order tools? Lead time on pre-order tools. Uh, I'm making the pre-order tools in the last week of August. So they'll be kind of shipping towards the end of the last week of August to the beginning of the first week of September. And pre-ordering tools is at blacksmithingtools.co.uk, by the way, in case you are curious. And that's really, you know, for hammers. That's, that's, that's all I'm offering for pre-orders right now. I just don't have time to, to be making any other stuff. I've got so much on my plate, which I can assure you is a wonderful, wonderful thing that I'm very pleased about. There's, uh, there's certainly never, never any point complaining about having too much on one's plate. Okay. So if you've ever come and taken a course here at the workshop, every single one of you has always commented about this thing, which is that I cannot drink a glass of water while I'm working unless I'm like completely stood still, I spill half of it on me, which is something I've very cleverly done right now. You know, it's like, hey, I have a great idea, Alec, why don't we go live in front of like 150 people and then dribble your water on yourself. It's great, you know, I mean, hey, <laughs> I dribble water when I drink it in the workshop, like what can I say? Okay, here's, here's how it's got to work. If I want to drink this, I've got to concentrate. Okay. You know you're a blacksmith when you can drink water so professionally. Okay, let's do some more forging. Let's stop this piece oxidizing too much. Okay, so we're going back in that fuller mark. Notice the pace that I'm working. Something I really try and talk a lot about is staying relaxed at the anvil. There's no point rushing, guys. Keep it easy. This is a drop forged belt buckle. I never thought I would uh, own drop forging technologies, but apparently I do now. This is hard work as it is. There's no point making it any harder on ourselves by trying to go and do the headless chicken dance. Headless chicken dance isn't any fun. Make it easier for yourself. Take it, at, uh, take it a little slower and you know, do things in a determined fashion. Plan out what you're gonna do in the heat. Make sure your tools are ready where they need to be. And in that determined fashion, you're able to work pretty calmly because you know, okay, my tool is right over there. I can grab it and work and stay pretty relaxed at the same time. Very, very important, especially when you're kind of working with a striker, you're working in a team of people. You don't want to go ahead and get flustered um, and, and worry too much, you know, you do have to be expedient. But you, like, there's a health and safety risk, right? If you're getting crazy about this stuff, you're dropping it, you're flying stuff all over the place, you know, people can lose fingers, people can like die and stuff like that. We don't want people to die, like that would be bad. I mean, that would just be terrible. Gnarly, one, two, two, three. I'm thrilled this is the first live show that you've caught. Hey, old James, commenting that there's too much yak yak. 
If you're not familiar with the expression, the expression less yak yak, more whack whack was coined on the first episode of the live show by a gentleman who I'm, I, I don't know who it was, but somebody commented less yak yak, more whack whack. We thought it was very funny. We're gonna make t-shirts about it eventually. But I do just wanna mention something guys, if you wanna have less yak yak and only the whack whack, like that's how I make my living, go buy an online course. We're here to have a little bit of fun. If you can't stand the yak yak, go to beginbacksmithing.com. It's all whack whack there. You know what? I don't need any of those tools. I'm gonna go ahead and drop them off. Give it another wire brush. Hit the fullers. So if you guys are ever making bottle openers, Here's something that Brian Brazil told me to do. First time I ever learned from him was to not make bottle openers and full of them for sale. You know, make bottle openers and chisel them. Same thing kind of applies for this. The process of fullering does take a lot more time as opposed to chiseling. We could have got the chiseling done in that first heat and fullering does take a significant amount more effort, time and practice to get right. But the result is a much more pleasing aesthetic. And in this case, I'm making this for fun on this show. I'm not too worried about like the expediency and the efficiency to put bread on the table um, in this case. So yeah, I want to follow it because I think it looks sexy. You know, look at that sexy mane. That's cool, guys. That's freaking cool. Okay. I'm going to flatten that off. Now we're going to apply our bends. Oh, I'll flip that around. That's pretty centered. I like the look of that. Do I want a little more bend in the neck? Mm, yeah. I think I might put a... I think that's good, actually. We'll go ahead and leave that at that. So, the bends that we're going to put in now, the bends that allow it to kind of raise up off the belt so that we can slip that belt in there twice, once with the loop that comes around and clips and another one with the other part of the belt. I'm sure there's like a precisely specific terminology regarding how to do the belt hardware. I just don't know it. So, you know, hey. Cody Lynch, thank you so much for wanting to share this on Facebook. I really appreciate that. Now what did I need? Hey, would you be able to do me a favor? I, uh, if you could, if you could grab me a little bit of electrical cable, I'd sincerely appreciate that. Preferably not the HDMI cable though. Like, <laughs> oh, ah, oh no, no, <laughs> tripped over it. Here we go, I'll set this back up, it's all good. Sorry guys, what we're just gonna do is I'm gonna just readjust this. Um, we, we tripped over the cable a little bit. Okay, just readjusting the camera. Sorry guys. Oh, I, I literally only need an inch. Thank you, Sam. Okay, I think we're back again. Let's see if we broke the camera. <laughs> oh, I just knocked it to the side, let's have a look. Let's see how square we are. Oh, we're a little off square. Which way do you guys want to go? A little bit that way. Golly, it's off square. What have you done to it, Sam? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go ahead and call that square enough. Square enough for blacksmiths, that is. Okay. Yeah, because all I need is just the t tiniest slither of copper. I'm going to grab a pair of scrolling tongs to fish that out of the fire. Okay, so now I'm just going to drop that over the edge of the anvil, I reckon. You could also do it in the vise. Um, I kind of like the idea of doing it over the anvil for some reason. Square it up.
And then I don't want to damage any of the footer lines. So I'm just going to go ahead and, you want this out of the way? I'll grab that out of the way. I'm going to go ahead and uh, flatten this with a wooden mallet. Grip it right there. And then grip it back over here. Smoke yourself out with the wooden mallet. What fun. So guys, of course, I would love to hear what you want me to make next week in the theme of adornment. Of course, you know, the plan, mission, aim, goal, aspiration, and hope is to make this as entertaining as possible for you. So if you think of a way that you could, we could make this more entertaining for you, and you think of how we could incorporate that into the theme of adornment, please go ahead and let us know. I would be thrilled to hear it. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and give that a light little grip in the nice there. As I give that a little bend. What fun! I do like making belt buckles, they're very fun. Wonderful project to make. I would love to see kind of photos of the stuff that you guys get up to. You know, if you ever try any of the stuff that you see on these streams, go ahead and send me a photo. Send it in a Facebook message to this page. Okay. Wonderful. So now I'm going to apply my touch mark and then we're going to give it a light heat and we're going to apply the bend to it. The touch mark will just about fit right here. Fantastic. Always got to put your vanity sticker on a piece of steel. It is crucially important that you put your vanity sticker on. Great. There's a little bullet. Thank you so much, Sam. Really appreciate that. Okay, I reckon that'll work. It should work. So, Mark, with all due respect, I would be thrilled to hear how you think a door knocker could be adornment of the body. Um, I appreciate the suggestion, but how can we adorn the body with a door knocker? I don't know. Spurs is a freaking awesome idea. Dustin, you come up with the best ideas. I really appreciate that idea. Keith Nut Brown is asking if there are places to stay in the area. Here in Norwich in the United Kingdom, I'm like smack bang in the center. Um, you know, I'm like a. 25 minutes walk from the cathedral, which I guess you would call the very center. So there are plenty of cheap lodging situations nearby if you do ever want to come and take a course. Thank you so much for asking, Keith. What's going on from YouTube? Okay. Okie dokie. This is kind of one of the last opportunities to give it a good brush, so take the opportunity to do that. Really clean it up as best I can. Now those high temperatures are the best temperatures for brushing. Then, you'll notice I can take this wood block. I've gone ahead and done a little dip in there, and I like using this when I do the bottle openers. Get a little bit of a, a, little bit of a slight subtle bend in there, just to match the curvature of, uh, of one's frontage. And I'm going to take a top fuller, and I'm going to bend it. And of course, the reason I like using a wooden block for this is as opposed to something that was steel, the wooden block is not going to mar the item now that we've punched it all in. I'm going to put that to the side. Quite an extreme bend right now. So I'm going to actually make it a little bit more subtle. So I'm going to take the wooden block back, and we're going to straighten it out a touch. Feed it in. Wonderful. A little bit, a little bit straighter. Yeah. I reckon that'll do just fine. So now we're gonna let that cool down. And this is where I want. Here's where I want the barrage of questions because we do need to let this cool down for the next step. So here's where I want you to barrage me with questions. Ask as many forging questions as you can. 
This is gonna be the five minutes where I'm gonna be able to answer them best as I'm not gonna be distracted with a piece of hot steel. This, I'm just gonna lay that. I'll give you a look of what it's like first. If we can just go ahead and switch to that camera, Sam, I'd be so appreciative. Here's what it looks like right now. I'm gonna lay that face down, however, because when it's face down, I know a little more contact with the anvil will help it cool off a little faster. Lay that on top. Conduct some of the heat out of there. I mean, there'd be way better ways of, of, of subtly cooling it down. But that's what we're gonna do for now. While your guys kill the fire, that's a great idea. It is gonna go back on in a little bit, but goodness, I'm trying to take my glove off without the uh, the immense amount of electrical tape on my thumb coming with it. No. Okay, come on. Okay. How do you explain why you won't be making Damascus? Why well, I'm not going to be making Damascus? <laughs> okay, so the process of Damascus um, takes a little while, a, a lot of time. You know, we're using power hammers. We've got to stack the billet, weld the billet, manipulate the pattern. Like getting any type of interesting pattern takes a long time. Being able to condense that into one show, pretty difficult. You know, of course, I've got to, I've got to bear in mind that you know we got to, we got to keep you guys entertained, keep you guys pumping full of, full of fun content, and I just worry that we wouldn't be able to do that in that time because in the hours time period, all you would see would be welding the first billet, manipulating the pattern, and letting it cool down because you've got to let it cool down to cut it up and restack it and remanipulate the pattern. So doing Damascus, tricky. Now I could take a piece of Damascus and make something out of it, but. You might as well just see me make it out of mild steel because there is also the finishing time required to take said Damascus piece, polish it up, etch it, and, and do the final finishing on that. If you want to see Damascus stuff, I'll do Damascus stuff in other videos that you can find on my YouTube channel. And if you're not subscribed to my YouTube channel, like, what are you doing? Seriously, like, I'm just saying, I think you should... Oh, I tripped over my wire. If you're not subscribed to the YouTube channel, I really think you should be. I try my absolute hardest to put the best content out there I physically can. I've been devoting a huge amount of time to learning the best editing practices I can, the best kind of you know movie making practices I can, so that every single day you get a nice snippet, a nice little dose, a nice shot of forging goodness. So please, please, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Okay, so next step. I didn't even spill any water. That's a success. I will call that a great success. So, for the pin that holds the belt buckle into the belt, I'm going to take this, which, um, what is that, 330 seconds welding electrode. Uh, you can use 8th inch welding electrode. That would work great too. Uh, in fact, I think 8th inch electrode would be a little bit better. And sometimes if you're lucky, you now you take a stub of, of one that you've already been welding with. It has a nice little ball on the end, so it'll kind of lock itself into the hole on your belt. This particular one, I, I like rarely stick weld anymore. It doesn't have that little ball on it. Um, when I'm making uh, belt buckles, usually I'll go ahead and stick that up in the vise and hit it with a MIG welder just to put a little bead on the end so it will pop in and out. In this instance, it's not gonna have that bead, um, you know, cause I don't wanna weld on the end of the thing. Um, I'm gonna cut it off in anticipation for this being the peg. And to do that first, I'm gonna undo my belt and um, we'll try not to get any wrong ideas here, guys. And I'm gonna measure how long it needs to be. Okay, so if I can read that, that's 13 plus, I would say three, it needs to be 16 millimeters long, about five eighths of an inch long. Should do just fine. So if I measure this, we can clip it off with these, these cheapo, uh, El Cheapo cutters. Okay. And so of course once this piece cools, we're then going to find the center. Mark it out with the center punch. And then drill the hole to accept this. And then we're going to do a couple interesting techniques to make sure that this pin stays in there. We're going to copper uh, what would be the term for it? Like, you know, copper braze this in there, and then we're going to forge the material around it to tighten it all up so that this pin doesn't come out. Pretty fun technique. And we'll do that by dipping a little piece of copper in there, 
in the hole. There we go. Throwing a little piece of copper in the hole. Heating it up until that copper melts, becomes molten. And then we can simply lay this in there, give it a little tap, and then forge the, forge the material around it. And that makes a wonderful pin. So I'm going to radius that off for a little bit. And uh, that's great. Fantastic. So that's ready. But because I know I'm going to lose that if I don't keep it somewhere safe, I'm going to make sure it is where I need it to be. Josh Myers asks if he heats an old hammerhead um, and makes it into a top tool. Is that going to be safe to strike? I want to let you know that I have no clue. For the reason that I have no clue what material the hammerhead's made out of, I have no clue what life it's been through, I have no clue whether it has any microfactures in it that would mean that you know, you'd hit it and it would explode even if it was normalized. I have no clue about that. So take that on as your own damn risk, you know. <laughs> but the chances are, provided the steel is in good state, provided it hasn't had too hard of a life, yes, if you normalize that thing by heating it up, forging it, and letting it cool down in air, that's going to be perfectly safe to use as a top tool. Usually, but I don't know. You know, then you take that risk. Take take that risk yourself. Mr. Crunky ninety two on YouTube is asking what oxidation is. Um, can I explain it a bit more on what causes it? Oxidation is simply um, the fact that we have high temperatures here, and as we as we as we give more energy to a material, it's going to be reacting faster with oxygen. Um, and so oxidation is like just the same as rusting, um, except we're making it happen like super, 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 super fast because we're adding so much energy to this, energy to the reaction that it occurs really fast. That's all the flaking that you see around, that is oxidation, that are oxides from the steel, from the iron reacting with the oxygen. Uh, the problem is, is the more they react, you develop this thick coating of oxides and it's not homogenous to the steel, so as you forge it, it'll create dimples in the surface and pit the surface, and it's kind of, kind of a little bit, uh, little bit makes, leaves a little bit of a nasty finish. Forrest, I love your idea of me forging a chess set in the future. What a fantastic idea. That would be a really fun thing to do for a video. Okay, is this cool? Ah, a little, little while longer to cool. I can prep everything else for the drilling. See if I can find a nice way to clamp it. Hmm. Fire bricks, ceramic wool, but I'm still working on the best ways of, of, of doing that, creating the best, best lasting forge. Because you know, a little bit of replacement that has to go on, keeping things maintained in the forge, and I'd kind of like to avoid that too much. T-shirts and stuff been posted, haven't they? Yeah. Oh yeah. Just saying. All the free stuff's on its way. You should have it. You should have that free stuff by now if it hasn't arrived. Okay. Let's see if I can use this. Come on, cable. Don't trip me over. So of course, usually when drilling this hole, I would use a, uh, a pillar drill, of course, you know, much more control, you can really control your depth on it. But in the interest of firstly showing you how to do this with a very limited setup and show you guys that you do not need a lot of tools, you do not need a very large investment in tooling to start making beautiful things, you know, I want to show you that, yeah, you can do this with a hand drill, you don't need to have the pillar drill. Um, so I'll do it with a hand drill, I'm just going to be cautious not to drill all the way through and very cautious, of course, because a hand drill and a teeny weeny little drill bit like this, you know, hey, pretty damn easy to snap that bad boy if you're not careful. So uh, I'm, I've got to bear that in mind as I drill that hole. Sorry? Ah, you'll be able to film it from there. That'll be just fine.
Okay, so get my copper ready. How about that? Interesting thing about this piece of copper is usually it's, it's solid. Here it's going to wire, which has a benefit actually in, in, in the sense that it's likely going to melt a little bit faster. Hello? Why heat treat three times? I'm not a metallurgist. I do, uh, you know, I do, I do simple tools that require, you know, simple processes to get them to do the job. I'm not a metallurgist. I only work with uh, empirical evidence that I've seen and, and, and learning from what others have said. If you want to know about heat treating, find somebody that knows a little more about heat treating. Find a knife maker um, that does a lot of heat treating and, and makes nice knives. They likely often do have a good, good sense of metallurgy, but you know, very few things that I make need to be heat treated. So bear that in mind. You know, try and look for somebody that knows a little more. I apologize. Ned Bell, I should get a wireless mic pack. Uh, yes, I have a wireless mic pack. Um, the trouble is, is this is a wireless mic pack that costs like $200 um, and it's crap. Um, it, it works like 60% of the time and the 40% of the time it doesn't work. It's a problem, it makes it actually, like, it's, it's terrible. So I do have a wireless mic pack, but if I want to get one that like works consistently, I'd probably be looking in the, in the ballpark of 600 to thousand dollars. And you know, I've spent a lot of money on the equipment to put on these live shows. And I have to say that the best audio results I've ever achieved has been with this microphone, which is an Audio Technica wired microphone. And it's very inexpensive and it produces very nice audio. And you know what? For the sake of having to deal with this wire, I like the fact that I know it's gonna work every time. I have a couple backup mics that are wired. I bought several of these. I have one in my truck. So I know that anywhere I go, so long as I'm in my truck, I've got a backup microphone in case I cut this bad boy because this is the best lapel mic that I've used so far. Um, and so that's why, uh, that's why we're not using the wireless. What pressure are you running the forge at? What pressure am I running the forge at? Firstly, let me get back there. Firstly, pressure, it's kind of irrelevant. Um, Venturi forges do require more pressure to be run uh, than like a forced air forge, but Venturi for forges run the gas through a much smaller orifice. Uh, I don't know why it's important to talk about pressure because of course, like, it, it means nothing. What really is, is, is important is about like the actual like flow, the consumption um, of gas that you're using and that's not measured by pressure because of course if you've got 15 psi going through a number 70 hole that's a lot different to 15 psi going through a eighth inch nipple right you know so if you want to know what pressure i'm running it at uh, i could tell you in bars on this particular one i'm running it at half a bar so anybody that happens to have a tab open right now if you could type in the conversion for half a bar um, to, to uh, pounds per square inch, I'd be able to let you know. So if anybody could do that, I'd be super appreciative. I would, I would really, really appreciate it. Okay. Sam, can you do me a big favor? I believe I have some borax. On that shelf in the very left-hand corner, there should be some borax. Yeah, if, if you see that, that'd be lovely. Great, let's drill this bad boy. It should be cold enough. Appreciate you guys hanging on in there. That's just fantastic. Okay, so lay this out. Sorry? Uh, in any of the tin cans above it? Superb. Is that just a little bit? Great. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Okay. So, take it. So I'm gonna line up uh, roughly halfway, do a little blacksmith's measure. 22.3 uh, 
is all very rough. It doesn't really matter too much how critical this is uh, centered. You know, there is a certain amount of adjustment in the belt anyway. But uh, right about if I line that puppy up, I see it's going to want to be eh, right about there. So I'm going to take my center punch. Of any course, you know, you can tell there is not a huge amount of concern for accuracy while I'm doing this. I don't need to be super concerned about accuracy. I just want a ballpark of where I want to be. Give it a little pin brick. Great. Okay, center punch mark is done. I'm now going to go ahead and set this up in this uh, in this little ramshackle jig right here, and we're going to give that a little. Uh, drill that bad boy and try and make sure to not drill all the way through you know so bear in mind how thin your material is sorry if you guys hear the noise of the drill pretty loudly right here sorry about that you know I want to try and go Three quarters of the way through, or something like that. <laughs> Definitely not too far through there. Too far through, we're going to be. Uh, oh, it's going to be a problem. But I doubt we'll go too far through. I'm going to take a little bit more. <laughs> Trying to make sure you don't get too far through there is a little nerve wracking. Okay, so now we're gonna take some of this copper wire. Thank you, Nick. I really appreciate you uh, doing the PSI conversion. But you say seven PSI to 14 PSI to one bar. Oh, I see, I, I apologize. It's seven PSI, there is 14 pounds per square inch to one bar of pressure. And so I'm running this forge at seven pounds per square inch right now through an Amal Long Venturi burner with, I believe, a tip size of 110. It's their one inch burner. Uh, if you buy the Amal burners, oh, rats. Um, do I have any steel armored cable anywhere? I don't think so. If you buy the Amal burners, um, it seems to be that they run a little better if you get a if you get a slightly smaller nozzle on the uh, on the tip than what they sell it with. They seem to run a little better that way. Oh, you know, I really need some solid cable for this. I'm trying to think as to whether I have any steel armored cable. Thinking, thinking, thinking. Where would I keep some steel arm and cable? That's generally solid core. Um, in that, here's an option. That needs to be copper, sorry. Um, what do I keep that's got solid copper handy? I think this would probably be the best choice. We would just take, cannibalize this real quick. Ah. Can you grab me those side cutters, please? I'd really appreciate that. Yeah, guys, let's, let's show them the intro again. If you guys haven't seen this intro, you, you kind of should. It, it looks pretty awesome.
Five. Sorry? Five. Are we live again? Oh, I lost the piece of cable. Oh, sorry about this, folks. There we go. We got it. Okay. So I apologize for that, guys. I've cannibalized one of my extension. Oh, I dropped it again. Cannibalized one of my extension cables. This was wire that's kind of, you know, strands, but this here is much thicker. So it's a lot easier to get that into the hole. So you guys should be thankful. I just cannibalized an extension cable for that beefy one, too. Okay. I'm going to make sure I don't lose that. Now this wire is going to go... Oh. Top tip, don't grind your thumb off. That's a bad idea. It means you lose a lot of... I didn't grind the whole thumb off. My goodness, the hyperbole is flowing tonight. I did not grind the whole thumb off. I just took a little bit of the tip off. But uh, it's a bad idea. It means you lose a lot of dexterity. What are you trying to do? It's going to work. Come on. There we go. Fantastic. A little too much. It's all right. We don't need too much in that hole. Okay, you guys are seeing a lot of finicking. Let's see if I can... Okay, finally, we've got the copper in the hole. Now I'm also gonna just sprinkle a little dab. A borax. A little dab of borax in there. Uh, I'd love to be able to tell you some science behind why that's important, but I guess it kind of helps for some reason. Science, hashtag science. Tongs, tongs, right here. Now we're gonna set that in the fire and we're just gonna gently bring that up to temperature. I'm gonna move a brick slightly. I don't even think we're gonna need the forge to be running for this particular step. Just wanna bring it up to about an orange temperature. You know, it seems to be where the copper likes to start melting. Make sure it's level, otherwise that copper might slip out of there. <laughs> Just try and keep an eye on it. Right, any more questions, guys? What is going on, Trig? Great to see you. I hope you're enjoying the forge. Sam, could you do me a favor? I'd sincerely appreciate it if you could fill that up. Thank you so much. Let's give a big round of applause for Sam. Thank you so much. Sorry? I know, I know. My goodness. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh my goodness, this is good water. I keep telling everybody, best water anywhere in the world comes right out of that sink, right out of the tap on that sink. That, it's great water, just letting you know. I uh, love that water. I don't know if that's just like, because I'm on the industrial estate and it's like industrial runoff that just makes it taste great. Um, it might well be. <laughs> or it might just be because anytime I actually consume the water here at the workshop, I'm parched. Uh, and so I appreciate it more. But water here is just like amazing. I love this water. Ah. Connor, I am not going to make a sword as part of this theme of adornment. I'm sorry. I... <laughs> This ain't not gonna happen. Huh. So I turned the forge on because I'm getting impatient. I want that thing to get a little harder a little sooner. And I'm now just gonna try and have a look at the copper as soon as that thing melts. Uh, I'm gonna a pair of gloves on. One glove on. I threw it all the way over here. As soon as that copper melts, we'll bring it out and we're gonna tap our little pin in there. But I'm gonna want that pin to be held in. Uh, in some skinny little pliers. Okay. Oh. Okay. 
Ready? Oh, has it changed? Oh. I reckon we're about ready to go. Oh no, it's still solid. Gotta light that forge up again. Knuckle duster. You know how many years in prison I'd get for making a knuckle duster in this country? It'd be, my goodness, I'm not making a knuckle duster. I don't wanna, especially not live. I like having at least some illusion of freedom being out in the real world. Necklace pendant, great idea. Yes, I appreciate that. From Dustin, you guys, Dustin, you give the greatest suggestions. I appreciate that. And now I don't want that to dishearten anybody else from giving questions because I don't say. But like, you know, competition's great. Like, try and one up Dustin. Gene Smith's dog thinks that <laughs> slack tub water is the best type of drinking water. Hey, whatever rocks his boat. If slack tub water is what he likes, then great. <laughs> Oh, nah, heat up. I've forgotten quite how hot this needs to be. I always assumed it was, uh, it's been a little while since I've done this type of bottle opener. Let's see how this, uh, how this goes. Come on, copper, melt. Oh, hey, it's happened. We have some melted copper. Right, hey, here we go, let's do this. Let's see how many times I mess up before we get this right. Ba -ba. Right, we have liquid copper in our hole. Oh, it's like. Tap that bad boy in. Then, the next step, just to really make sure we secure that thing in there, take this and drive it. And that pin, as a result, should be pretty strong. But while that cools down, it'd be embarrassing if it came right out. It's in, it's tight, it's locked the copper has fused, and by taking this monkey tool, and you guys, this is why you need to buy that Brian Brazil online course, you're gonna learn some amazing things about how to use this in securing stuff. Um, there's, he does an incredible technique in that online course. Go ahead and check that out at beginblacksmithing.com. Now, beginblacksmithing.com. Coupon code LIVE20 for 20% off, but he does some amazing stuff with this thing, kind of around the, around the theme of that to help secure certain items, which you'll find out more about. And the copper fusion and that, that means that pin is in there pretty damn well. So, good, 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 good. I'm just gonna get in and let that cool down. I could take the opportunity to give it a little bit of a wire brush, if I can kind of avoid moving the pin around while it's still hot. There we go, just like that. How long does a propane bottle last me? Um, these 47 kilogram bottles, which, uh, hey, Kala, if you're watching, like, I'm up for a sponsorship. Sponsor me, and I'll, I'll plug you, because Kala rocks. So does Flow Glass, if Flow Glass is watching. And so does Air Liquide, if Air Liquide is watching. Who else sells propane? BOC. BOC, if you're watching, your gas rocks. Sponsor me, any of you guys. Now, if that's pandering, if that's not pandering, I don't know what is, I believe would be the better way of phrasing what I was about to say. <laughs> there we go. 
let that cool off a little bit. Let's answer some more questions. Let's see how you guys are doing. Let's also remind you the reason that we're doing a Brian Brazil horse head belt buckle today. And that is because this week on Wednesday, in fact, we launched Brian Brazil's online course that I would love for you to go ahead and check out. It's at beginblacksmithing.com and it's gonna show you how to do some of the Brian Brazil, some of the Brazilian school of blacksmithing things that Brian has not shown too much yet, but has done a lot of and is, they're, kind of in, they're, they're incredible things, you know, for example, the um, Forge Welded Bundle. It's amazing to see, it's an amazing project, and it's something that he's had people of all ages, you know, people from as young as 10 have immense success at. Very simple way of joining pieces of metal together and being able to make very aesthetic and beautiful forms. With that technique, in the online course, he makes a, um, a wool sconce with two beautiful leaves and a tendril and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a cup that's very interestingly secured. Um, he makes that wool sconce. He also makes a beautiful hummingbird. Oh my goodness, if you've never seen a Brian Brazil hummingbird, it's astonishing. Uh, from there, he goes on and does scrolling and coloring, and he does the three-dimensional horse head, three-dimensional version of this, and it's kind of awesome, and you kind of got to check it out. Oh, how long does the propane tank last you? I just, I just like completely derailed your question. Sorry about that. So these propane tanks, um, this is a 47 kilogram, you know, roughly about 100 pounds um, of, of propane in there. I, I don't know, in gallons. I think you guys measure it in gallons in the US. Uh, but it's, you know, one of the bigger ones. It lasts me between 30 to 45 hours um, of forge time, depending on how I'm running it, you know? depending on the condition of my insulating materials in my forge. Oh, sorry, I think I hit the mic. You know, sometimes the insulating materials, you know, they're in top notch condition, and you know, you, you get a lot more use out of it. Yeah, sometimes less so. And sometimes you're just a little careless, you know, sometimes you don't get the oxygen mix just right, and you know, you might just, you know, you, the air mix, really, I mean, if, you know, you're not pumping oxygen in, you're pumping air in that happens to have oxygen. Um, so that can affect it, you know. Basically, it depends how you're running the forge. If you're doing big stock, you'll burn through more. But yeah, between, you know, if I say between 30 and 45 hours per tank, that's about reasonable. And in cost, uh, I pay between 47 pounds, about $65, and 67 pounds for a bottle of this, depending on where I get it. Uh, between 47 pounds, 67 pounds, that's between about $65 and $105 US. Um, and so, you know, works out that, okay, when I'm forging, it's... Uh, you know, in the region of between one pound seventy-five to three pounds per hour of forging, which I think is pretty good. You can make a lot of stuff in that time. You know, you, it's it's not worth thinking about with the amount of stuff that you can make at that time. Quite a few recommendations for making on Facebook, on YouTube. Sometimes. On YouTube, leaf brace. Lo love the idea. Pocket-sized hammer. That is an awesome idea. Like that's just a cool idea. I like that idea. Hammer charm for a forge bracelet, awesome anvil charm, fantastic. Guys, you guys rock. You guys rock, you guys are making some really great suggestions, I really appreciate that. Let's see how cool that is. Give that a little bit of a wire brush. I want my tongs. So Lyle commented about a technique of wetting your brush and wire brushing, saying that it works a little better. Really, I think that probably would have worked a little better had this been hotter um, to pop the scale off. Right now it's only like 500 degrees Fahrenheit probably. And it certainly helps shine it up. And again, you know, if I was doing this to, to, to make these and sell them, I wouldn't be using a wire, hand wire brush for this. I'd let it cool down and I'd go ahead to my bench grinder where I have a wire wheel mounted there. And I'd use that, but I do want to show you guys, like forging is so accessible. I think forging is an incredibly accessible craft that is very easy to start doing as a hobby. You know, provided you approach it in the right way, you don't need to spend a lot of money to get into this. You know, this, this setup, you don't need this fancy anvil to do that. You can take a block of steel and make the exact same thing. You know, a bloody block of steel, be it a forklift tine or a five inch round piece of steel, eight inches long. You can do all of this stuff, provided you get creative and you use your imagination to work around some of the things that you've got to work around. And, uh... Let's see if we can cool it off a little bit. Okay, somebody has asked me to make a Saxon helmet. Um, wonderful suggestion. I don't think I'm quite going to be able to do that in what, like, what are we at now? An hour and... 
hour and a half? Yeah, I'm not going to be able to make a, make a helmet in an hour and a half. <laughs> Gauntlets? I can't make steel gauntlets in an hour and a half. Okie dokie. So I want to thank you, you know, if you guys haven't shared this stream, like when you come back on next week, because I know you're going to come on back next week. I mean, this is pretty fun hanging out with you guys. Like share the stream next time. For now, let's go ahead and show you what this belt buckle looks like. My goodness, never thought I'd undo my belt live on air. Sorry? I'll look after that. You know, you don't get to take my Damascus belt buckle, Sam. That thing is... Okay, moment of truth. Let's see if it works. Ta-da! We have... The forged belt, I'm, trying to, I'm looking in the mirror image, it's different, I'm like, which, which hand is where? In the mirror image, we have the forged belt buckle right there, guys. Hold on. It looks a bit perverse. It looks a little perverse. We switch over to the other camera. There we go, forged horse head belt buckle. Brian Brazil horse head belt buckle. Again, if you haven't checked out the online course, please do. It's at beginblacksmithing.com and you can grab 20% off. If you use coupon code LIVE20, as with all of the other online courses up there, coupon code LIVE20 is gonna get you 20% off. I would really appreciate it if you would go over here, over there, and I'd be thrilled to uh, help provide you with some of that information to take you on to the next level in your blacksmithing hobby. Uh, that's what we're here for, to so help you out in that way and hopefully make it entertaining along the way. I wanna thank all of you, 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 all of you for watching. It means the world to me. Every time we do one of these things, I wanna keep going. I wanna light the forge again and keep going and make more stuff. But it's like, what? Okay, it's almost 12 o'clock. <laughs> we've, we've got to head off, guys. You know, we're, we're committed to providing like, you know, as entertaining content for you as possible. And I'm just thrilled that you've all watched. I hope that as many of you shared as possible. And of course, I really hope that we're gonna see you next week. Sam, I wanna thank you for your help so much. Thank you so much, please wave to the camera. Woo, thank you Sam. Everybody please thank Sam for manning the computer, manning the cameras to set all this up and, uh, and help us out so I don't have to run over there and do all that. And, you know, it makes it much more interesting for you guys, I'm sure. Thank you so, so, so much, Sam. And everybody who viewed, thank you. It means the world to me to have all your support, all your wonderful comments, wonderful suggestions and wonderful ideas. That's why we do this. I can't wait to see you next week, of course. We do this every single week at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and at uh, 10 p.m. British Summer Time. And what's that, like 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time? Bell buckle, again. Bell buckle, right there? No, not on that one. Not on that one? On which one? Hang on. Yeah, on that one. There we go, on that one. There's the bell buckle. Woohoo! <laughs> 2 p.m. Pacific, Pacific Standard Time. <laughs> we do this every week on a Saturday. I am thrilled to see you next week when we do this again. And also remember to go and subscribe to my YouTube channel, Alex Steele, youtube.com forward slash Alex Steele. You'll find it. I would love for you to subscribe. I try my best to put out the best content possible. If you're on Facebook and you haven't liked the Facebook page, please do that too. And you know, go to any other social media thing and just like type in my name. You'll find me and I'd love to see you there. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute, absolute pleasure. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Please like the page. And of course, I am just so thrilled to see you next week for another episode. Episode seven next week. Brilliant. Have a lovely day. My name is Alex Steele. Thank you, Sam. Bye-bye.